Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome back to my seminar series. Uh, this one for December, Tis the Season, and I often talk about uh, specifically Tis the Season for Giving and I talk a little bit about that and I'm going to a little bit later on. But I've also come to realize when I do my, uh, my April seminar on tax taxes that really a piece of the planning for that April seminar has to happen right now. Uh, if you want to minimize your uh, income taxes. So I wanted to talk about that too. So uh, once again, I'm, I'm, as usual, I'm talking about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, I've often told you that their goals in life are very simple. They want to live in their house until, the, until they die. They want to um, die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They want to leave everything to their kids. For this presentation, I'm going to add two more though, which I often hear about. They don't want to pay any taxes, or at least as little as possible. They're not want to trying to, ev to, to like evade taxes, but they don't want to pay more than their fair share. And they don't want to get clobbered by nursing home care costs later in their lives. And, and this is the older you get, believe me, I'm going to be turning 73 next month in January. The older you get, um, the more this concern about possible nursing home costs weighs on people's lives. So I want to talk about uh, those things a little bit. So uh, Fra Frank and Mary's assets in this case, uh, they own their house it's worth about $400,000. They've got joint savings worth about $300,000. Mary has an IRA of about $600,000. So their total assets are worth about $1,300,000. Uh, their income from Social Security, from interest on their savings, and from the RMD, the required minimum distribution, on Mary's IRA, which is pretty hefty because Mary's uh, IRA is pretty large, uh, is $40,000. Um, at $40,000, if that's their taxable income for federal purposes, the, high, the marginal rate on that high, the highest dollar that they're being taxed on is 12%. Their tax, if their income was $40,000, would be about $2,000. So, one of the things that Mary worries about though, and Frank does too, is what happens if at some point she needs to qualify for mass health because she needs nursing home care. Remember, if you're in a nursing home uh, for more than 100 days, Social Security will not cover it. Social Security covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. After that, you're on private pay at rates that range today from about $14,000 to about $18,000 a month, unless you're on mass health. So, uh, I want to talk about that, about how Mary would qualify for MassHealth because it helps you understand um, uh, what we're trying to achieve here. So if Mary needed to qualify for MassHealth while Frank was still alive, there really wouldn't be an issue. Um, uh, for Mary to qualify, she would have to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, which obviously they have a lot more than that. But, but Frank, as the, as the healthy spouse, could own the home. Uh, he could have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to $137,400. This is a number that changes every year. Uh, this is a federal government number. Uh, and, and Frank can have unlimited income. So what I would advise if Frank and Mary were coming to see me today, and, or, or if Frank were coming in because Mary were in the nursing home, is I'd say, Frank, don't worry about anything. All we have to do is we're going to transfer all of the assets from from jointly or from just Mary to just you, and that'll immediately make the house safe. We're then gonna, I'm then gonna have you keep, say, $100,000 of the remaining assets and use the, the, all the money over that to buy an annuity. And as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that was shorter than Frank's life expectancy at that time, the purchase of that annuity would be a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. If he did that, thereby reducing his remaining assets below the magic number, $137,400. The day after that, Mary would be eligible for MassHealth. The only problem in this fact situation, though, is that um, IRA, Mary's $600,000. If, in, because in order to transfer those IRA funds to Frank, Mary's gonna have to pull them out and pay the taxes on them. Um, the federal taxes are going to be fairly stiff. What's going to happen as a result of that is that Frank and Mary's combined income is going to jump from $40,000 a year to $640,000 a year. That's a big jump. And the top marginal rate of federal taxation that they're going to pay is 35%. So their total tax that year is going to be about $100,000. 
$161,000. So the question is, if you're Frank and Mary and, and, and you're thinking, about, thinking for, about the future, how can you plan so that if, if Mary needs nursing home care, you're not gonna have to take that tax hit? And the answer is really higher annual withdrawals from the IRA. Now I know that you're all gonna say now, well, but wait a minute, uh, I've always thought that we, what we wanna do is minimize our withdrawals from the IRA because by minimizing the withdrawals to nothing but the RMD, the required minimum distribution every year, we're minimizing our income tax. And in the short run, that may make sense, right? But, remit, but in the long run, if as a result of Mary needing to qualify for Mass Health at some point, she then has to take all the rest of the money out in, in one big lump sum, that ends up causing that huge tax hit. Alternatively, what Mary could do is take advantage of the fact that the federal income tax taxes, at, at taxes on different chunks of money at marginal rates. The marginal rate of taxation for income that is below $83,550 is only 12%. Remember what Frank and Mary were going to be paying in tax was 35% by pulling all of the money out at once. If instead they took advantage of this, of this fact and, and figured that every year, and I'm just giving you the example of these are the, these are the, are the, uh, are the, 22, the 2022 numbers, that if, if in 2022, for example, uh, Frank and Mary, in addition to the $40,000 of their income and their regular RMD, took out an additional $43,550 so that their total income was only $83,550, the marginal tax rate on all of their money would only be 12%. The additional tax to Frank and Mary in this particular year would only be about $5,000. If we assumed that, that they did that every year for the next 15 years, the total additional tax would only be, be $75,000 or, or less than half, less than half of the tax that they would have had to pay if Mary had taken out all of the money at the same time. So there's a, it, for, for tax planning purposes, this may make a lot of sense. By the way, even if Frank and Mary aren't worried about nursing home care, they may wanna think about doing this for another reason. And that is, if Frank and Mary are assuming that, or for, for suppose that they had more assets and they weren't even worried about nursing home care because they had long-term care insurance or whatever. In general, Frank and Mary's tax rate annually at, at on their income is going to be lower than that of many of their children. Once again, we're assuming, we're assuming in this case that Frank and Mary's income was only $40,000. But even if it was $75,000, the tax rate on that income that they're going to be receiving is going to be very low because it's simply going to, remember the income on your RMD, uh, or, or, or excuse me, the income on your, I, or the money that you take out of your IRA simply gets added to your other income. So it may very well be that, in, in, that if, if instead of taking out their, their, uh, their um, uh, IRA early and leaving it to their kids, their kids are gonna end up paying more tax on this money than they would because their kids may very well be in much higher brackets. I often talk to clients, not surprisingly, who are retired, m most of whose children or many of whose children are making much more than they do, probably much more than they ever did. Right? So in that case, as a, in, in, if, if the parents want to, if Frank and Mary want to maximize the amount of their money that ends up going to the kids, then regarding the IRAs, it may very well make sense for them, even without considering Mass Health, to take the money out early. Now, once they take the, the money out, well, what do they do with it? Um, oftentimes, you know, they, they're not even thinking about this because they've just got this money and they, it's an IRA and they take out the RMD. So they may, you know, they, they want to wanna pool it obviously with their other savings. They may want to get an investment advisor to invest the money. One alternative would be they may want to actually convert Mary's uh, um, a traditional IRA into a Roth IRA so that the, in, the, the income that they earn on those funds from then on in does not get taxed. But, the, but if Mary later needs to qualify for MassHealth and needs to shift the money to Frank, 
the vast bulk of that money, at least all of the money that they put in in the first place, is not going to be subject to income taxation. Another possibility, by the way, is they could also just give it away. They could just give it away. And I'm just going to talk about that uh, a little bit. They probably would not want to do that if they're concerned about nursing home care because um, while they're both alive because they, they, they realize that, that if one of them is alive, they can always just shift the money to the other spouse and do the things that I, that I talked to you about. Whereas if they left the money to the children or if they just gave the money to the children and then one needed to qualify for mass health, that gift would be subject to that, that five year look back period that we all know about. But take a different example. Say that Frank had died. He's just a picture on the wall and Mary is now trying to figure out um, what, how she can protect these assets, those same assets, $400,000 house and $900,000 in other assets from nursing home care. One way that she can do that is by simply giving away the assets um, and then waiting that five years. Now, um, oftentimes if, if, if I were talking to Mary and she only had one child, if she only had Peter, not Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. and she trusted him, I would tell her that, she, that the simplest way to protect those assets would simply be to give them to Peter. As long as she trusted the fact that if Peter, if she ever needed any of the assets, Peter would give the, the assets that she needed back to her or would buy the things that she needed. For most families where um, there are multiple children, what I typically recommend is that instead of doing, giving assets directly to the children, uh, you, give at, you create an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable means that whatever you put into it, you can't take back out of it. You create an irrevocable trust. You name as the trustee of that trust your most trusted child, you make that trustee the trust of the trust, the trustee for the benefit of all of the children, and you specify that following your death, whatever is left in trust is gonna get divided among those children. Uh, but you assume that while you're alive, uh, th that the assets are gonna stay in one big pile, uh, and that if you ever need the assets, that you can talk to the trustee, and the trustee will then distribute some of those assets to himself or herself, and then turn around and give them back to you. Um, so, so that's the, the kind of traditional strategy if you're trying to protect these assets and you're getting older and you're single as opposed to married. The issue on this case though, right, is if Mary gives those assets away, is, does something bad happen as a result of that gift? Is there a, an effect to giving away the, the assets? Now, Mary in this case probably would not want to give away her home uh, because for tax purposes, she'd be giving away the home with the lower tax basis. So I'm not going to go into that, but I want to talk about the other assets, the other $900,000. If she gives them away, she knows that five years and a day after they've been given away, they're no longer countable or lienable for mass health purposes. But isn't there a gift tax? Isn't there a gift tax? Um, isn't there something bad about giving the assets away? Well, the answer to that is really no. So once again, Mary's, uh, wh whether or not she's doing this for the benefit of, or in order to protect these assets for nursing home purposes, I'm gonna talk about what would happen if Mary gave away these assets early. Her goal would be, uh, ideally, if she were just giving them away and weren't worried about mass health later on, to give them uh, an equal shares to her three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, and now, if she was planning on giving those assets away when she died, the question is, why doesn't she give them away now? Um, well, the most common answer that I hear is this myth. Oh, if I give away more than a particular amount, uh, don't I have to pay a gift tax, right? The answer to that is no, but I want to talk to you about why. Uh, the myth of the $16,000 per year gift, um, gifting cap. Um, first of all, uh, if you give things away, there is no Massachusetts gift tax, first. And the receipt of a gift is not income. So by giving things away, you're not triggering a big income tax to your kids. The, um, the receipt of a gift is not income. So the only question is, what about the federal gift and estate tax system, which is the, which is the origin of this myth of the gift tax? Um, for the, at the federal level, 
uh, as opposed to in Massachusetts, there is a combined gift and estate tax system. So in Massachusetts, while there is an estate tax, if you have an, a, a taxable estate of more than a million dollars, you can literally give away your assets the day before you die and thereby avoid the Massachusetts estate tax. So, so, so then, then, then it, it, with one exception, I'm gonna talk about that. So the question is, so, and which some people have done, and which is definitely you can, it's possible to do. Um, so at the federal level, I think that somebody there w was thinking about this and said, well, wait a minute, we want to avoid that loophole. And so in, for the, at the federal level, there was a combined gift and estate tax system. The system is, uh, if you die, uh, you're single, and you leave a taxable estate of more than a given amount, which is now o over $12 million, that's right, $12 million, then the estate owes an estate tax. If you give away money before you die, you pay a gift tax, unless you qualify for one of the two gift tax exclusions. There are two basic exclusions. There's the one that everybody knows about, and there's the one that nobody knows about. The one that everybody knows about is that if you give away, that you have the ability to give away a given amount per person per year to anybody that you want. That amount used to be $10,000, um, but, uh, but, um, but there was an inflation provision in the federal law, so it has gone up over time. The amount actually in 2022 is $16,000. Um, so you can give anybody that you want up to $16,000 a year uh, without paying any, any uh, federal gift tax. In addition to that, in addition to all those gifts, even if, if you've made all of those gifts, in addition to those, though, uh, everyone has a lifetime exclusion, a gifting exclusion equal to the federal estate tax number, which now is about over $12 million. In other words, Unless over your lifetime you're planning on giving away more than over $12 million, there will never be a federal gift tax payment that you will ever have to make. So you can give away as much as you want to anybody you want at any time for federal gift tax purposes. So, so then, so in other words, going back to the Frank and Mary case and, or, or the Mary case regarding um, uh, mass health, Mary could literally give away all of her assets, including all of the $900,000, to her kids or to an irrevocable trust for the benefit of her kids, as long as she's not a beneficiary of the trust that's considered to be a completed gift, um, even though it wasn't given specifically to the kids, right? And she won't pay any, any gift tax. But now I wanna switch into this issue of, of doing the gifting in order to avoid the estate tax giving away to reduce or avoid the Massachusetts estate tax. So in order to understand um, your options in terms of uh, reducing or avoiding that estate tax, you need to understand a little bit about the estate tax itself, the Massachusetts estate tax. So Massachusetts imposes an estate tax on all estates of greater than $1 million. Uh, what is the taxable estate? The taxable estate and the probate estate are not the same. The assets that Mary owns in her own name, uh, which do not have named death beneficiaries, which, do, which aren't owned jointly with someone else, right, are assets um, that would pass through the probate estate. Mary could avoid probate by paying attention to those assets and figuring out, for example, in the case of investments, making sure that she's named death beneficiaries. If she has a life insurance policy, making sure she's named a death beneficiary, having assets held jointly with some of her kids. There are a number of ways that Mary could, could avoid probate uh, as to most, if not all, of her assets. For estate tax purposes, though, all of those assets remain part of the taxable estate whether it is life insurance proceeds or joint assets or assets where Mary dies and, and names somebody as a death beneficiary, all of those are part of the, of the, of the taxable estate. So uh, if Mary dies, leaving, a, leaving an, some, an estate, a taxable estate of some amount, then what the, the family needs to do at that point is to calculate whether there is an estate tax. You would calculate that two different ways. Under Massachusetts law, there are, there are two ways of calculating the estate tax. 
what you do is you take the taxable estate and you calculate the estate tax both ways and then you look at the, at the answer kind of, 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 of regarding the two estate taxes and you pay the lower number. Um, so there are two ways of calculating the estate tax. One is using the chart and one is using the alternative tax and you always pay the lower tax. What is the chart? The chart is the chart that was created when the estate tax was created, I believe in the 1920s, at which time if you died leaving a taxable estate of more than $40,000, it was considered that you had a lot of money, which sounds amazing at this point, until, but, and, and it sounded amazing to me when I first saw the chart, and then I remembered uh, that when my parents, um, who bought their home in 1940, uh, a two-family house, because the family was growing, um, they paid $2,000 for that house. Now, that was a tremendous amount of money. They had to get a mortgage, they had to rent out the other side of the house so that they could afford to pay the mortgage. This was a huge amount. So imagine at that time, $40,000 was 20 times the value of that house. Think about the value of your house, multiply by 20, and think about how much money that is, right? So, so anyway, that, that's the, so when the chart was created, $40,000 was a lot of money. And so if you had less than $40,000 in, in, in a taxable estate, you paid no estate tax. And after that, you paid using this graduated scale between 40 and 90,000, you paid 0.8 percent. Between 90 and 140,000, you paid 1.6 percent, and on and on. The highest rate of taxation is 16 percent. Uh, at the point at, that you're at around a million dollars, your rate is is around 6.4 percent. If you had a taxable estate of one million dollars, your estate tax would be. $36,560, $36,560. Now, what happened historically was that over time, basically the price of real estate went up, like a lot. Uh, and over time, therefore, folks, it, it, it started turning out that everybody in the middle class had a house, it was paying, there was an estate tax. And so they leaned on their legislators and the legislators, uh, instead of changing this chart, basically said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to create an alternative tax system. And the system is going to be, uh, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to increase that threshold number from $40,000 to a higher number for purposes of this alternate tax. And initially it was increased to $100,000, it was increased to $500,000, then six hundred. dollars I remember in my lifetime it was increased to that uh, million dollar figure. That happened, oh, about 20 years now. And, it ha and that has not changed since. So the alternative tax system is simple. You take the taxable estate, the very same taxable estate that we talked about before, and you, and you say, okay, if that taxable estate is less than a million dollars, you pay zero in estate tax. If it's more than a million dollars, you pay 40% of all the dollars over the million dollars. So if you have an estate, a taxable estate of a million dollars or less, you pay zero in estate tax. If you have an estate tax of a million and one dollars, you pay an estate tax of 40 cents um, because using this alternative tax because 40 cents would be 40% of one dollar. If you had an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, you'd pay an estate tax of forty thousand dollars, which is 40% of all the dollars over a million. There comes a point and that point is at around $1,125,000, where the alternate tax is actually higher than the regular tax. And at that point, you kind of forget about the alternate tax and you're just back to the chart. So using Frank and Mary's, as, or using Mary's as an example, she has $1,300,000. If she dies, you would, you would um, take that estate, you would calculate her liability using the chart, and the tax in that case would be about, be about $53,200. Um, you would then calculate the tax using the alternative, uh, which would be 40% of, all of, the, all of the dollars over a million, which would be 40% of $300,000 or $120,000. Mary would pay, in this case, the lower amount, which would be $53,200. Now, what about if Mary decides to gift her way out of the estate tax? She can do it two different ways. If she wants to take advantage of that alternate tax, uh, chart and therefore get her number below a million dollars and pay zero in tax, the gifts that she makes 
have to be no, have to be no higher than the federal gift tax gift tax amount. In this case, this year, sixteen thousand dollars per year. So what Mary could do is Mary could give make nineteen gifts of sixteen thousand dollars a piece. Which, if she took her kids, if she took her kids' spouses, if she took the grandchildren, and she added them all up probably wouldn't be hard to get to 19. So if she gave away 19 gifts of 16,000, or a total of $304,000, she will have, thereby reducing her remaining taxable estate to, to 996,000, or just below a million. And then she died, she would pay no estate tax. If she makes the gifts in amounts higher than that $16,000, right? then those, get, those extra gifts have to be added back into her estate, and therefore she couldn't take advantage of this system. But still, if Mary wanted to, she could give away that $900,000 the day before she died and still benefit by doing that. The reason for that is that even using, that once she's made those gifts, those gifts are no longer part of the taxable estate. Remember, the chart says that, the, that, the, that the, her tax on $1,300,000 on dollars would be $53,200. If Mary died with that amount, she'd pay $53,000, and by the way, that's an error. I made an error on this page. She'd pay $53,000, actually $200. If Mary gives away $900,000, the remaining, the tax, the estate tax on the remaining $400,000 is only $8,720. Because of my math error, my final savings amount is a little bit off, but not much. Her, she would save around $45,000 by literally giving all of the assets away uh, the day before she died. So, I hope you find, found this presentation uh, um, helpful, uh, both in terms of thinking about gifting uh, and in terms of thinking about um, uh, withdrawing more money from your IRA uh, every year before the end of the year. If you have any questions on any of this, uh, remember, you can always reach me um, by, you can, you can go on, on uh, YouTube and, and uh, Google uh, Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Um, remember the goal of life in all of this is to sleep well, right? Is to, it, that, so, so you know, if you have any questions on any of this, please give me a call at 508-860-1470. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays. We'll talk to you next year. Thank you very much.